would it be and is there any opportunity or would it be prudent to to investigate and talk about collectively in our community the opportunity to potentially reduce the current five acre minimum building lot size on the Rathbun Prairie. So that thought in, in the setting of one previous meeting with some legislators got us to uh, a meeting last, uh, second, beginning of the second week of September, where most of you were here and basically here's what we're doing. We're simply taking that concept and, and trying to understand scientifically, uh, uh, community-wise, politically, is this something that's viable? And our premise has always been, when I say our, Alan's and mine and Tom Torkson's, the, our premise has always been that this, if this only makes sense if it's scientifically sound. And that would simply be the, the beginning of extending into further conversations, collective conversations, and finding out, you know, then if it is scientifically sound, then uh, what are the next steps? There is no roadmap here. We're just, we're having conversations, and that's really what I want everyone to know. This is very unstructured, so that's the history. What we're going to do today, we have a presenter that I'll introduce in a little bit, what we're going to do today is learn a little bit about phosphorus and, and, and soil. And we're gonna learn that from a, an expert. Uh, the timing of that is uh, uh, Dr. Jim Hippolito will begin here in a little bit. He, his presentation will probably run us uh, right up about 10 minutes or so until noon. Then we're gonna go into some Q&A and, and, and please feel free. Uh, Dr. Hippolito has, uh, has said that he's willing to talk about anything but that then around 12.15, we're gonna break and we're, we're gonna have lunch. And during that lunch period, if more questions need to be answered, we're gonna do it in a much more casual fashion while we're eating, which is, which is a lot of fun. So uh, anyway, that's gonna be the timing of it. We want to be out here a few minutes before one o'clock today. Some other uh, uh, schedules uh, are demanding that. Dr. Jim Ippolito earned his Bachelor of Science degree in uh, Agronomy from the University of Delaware in 1989. It was 1992 when Dr. Ippolito received his master's degree from the University of Colorado, Fort Collins, and nine years later in 2001 when he earned his PhD in Environmental Soil Quality Chemistry from the same institution. From 91 to 2002, Dr. Ippolito was a research associate for the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences. Colorado State University and assistant professor from 02 to 07. Am I doing all right so far? Sounds good. Since 2007, he has held the position of research soil scientist, soil chemist at the USDA, ARS, Northwest Irrigation and Soils Research Laboratory in Kimberly, Idaho. As a member of the IDEQ's newly appointed subcommittee to the Technical Guidance Committee, there's a lot of committees in there, <laughs> formed to determine the impact of on site wastewater on surface and groundwater sources, Dr. Ippolito has provided valuable mathematical modeling related to the migration of phosphorus through a variety of Idaho soils. In his presentation today, he has offered to outline some of the work he has done for IDEQ TGC setback subcommittee, using layman's terms, which would be good for me. Additionally, Dr. Ippolito will once again answer any Q and A. With that said, Dr. Jim Ippolito. Wow, I don't think I've had an introduction like that in a very long time. <laughs> Thanks. How's everybody doing today? Good. good. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate being here, and I uh, appreciate Alan inviting me up. I actually was scheduled to come up this week anyway to uh, attend a conference down in Moscow, and uh, so the timing was just perfect. Thanks. You bet. I and hope. so what I'm going to do, I'm not, I'm not really going to touch on some of the work I did for the setback subcommittee, per se, but I will touch on some of the, the background information that um, you probably should be aware of in terms of how phosphorus interacts in soils, okay? And then if you have questions about um, the setback committee, subcommittee, I can answer those during the break as to the work that we did for that. So what we're gonna talk about for roughly the next 30 minutes, 45 minutes, is how phosphorus interacts in soils. And when we talk about phosphorus, if you're not aware, phosphorus 
actually is found in uh, a few different states in the soil. The main two states are H2PO4 and HPO4, and these are dependent on pH. Above pH 7.2, roughly, is when you start seeing these species, and below pH 7.2 in soils, you start seeing these species. And from what I understand from looking at soils maps of this area of, the, of Idaho, your, your soils tend to be below seven, roughly. Okay, not in all instances, but in most instances. So this is the form of phosphorus that you're gonna find in soils here, H2PO4. And so I think it's really important to, to understand why you would, in, in the world, wanna be concerned about phosphorus chemistry, or phosphorus in soils to begin with. Why? Because phosphorus is a component of ATP, ADP, and DNA. And ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and ADP is adenosine diphosphate, and DNA, we all know what DNA is. But ATP and ADP are, are the energy that keeps basically all living organisms alive. They're, this, this compound is created in your cells in mitochondria, and it's the, it's the compound that when we form these, these are phosphate um, molecules, these bonds, these little squiggly lines here, these bonds are really, really high energy bonds. And when they're broken, they release a lot of energy. And that makes you do this. And that makes you talk and your heart pump and break and uh, makes your lungs go in and out. It's for, it's for muscular contraction, it's really what it's for. So it's really important to have phosphorus or phosphate in the environment. And same with DNA. If you look at DNA, DNA, you know, it's this um, uh, twisted structure. And the backbone of DNA is actually um, sugar phosphate. So it has phosphate in it. So phosphate is really important, okay? When you look at plants, if you don't have enough phosphorus in the soil, you tend to see deficiency symptoms. And it's, um, phosphorus is, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a geek like me, phosphorus uh, is really, really beautiful when you see deficiency symptoms because it's purple. You typically have stunted growth, like you would in uh, de most deficiency symptoms of other elements. But you see purplish color, and it's on older leaves. So a good example here is corn, and you see purplish color in older leaves. And what that tells you is, as the plant grows, the phosphorus is being transported from older leaves to newer leaves. And so the older leaves show the deficiency symptom. You see some purplish color in uh, the interveins on tomato. And if you look at the roots, the reason why we have stunted growth is because this is healthy and a phosphorus rich environment, and this is phosphorus poor environment. So you get stunted growth, you typically see purplish color. It's not always the case, but uh, when you see a severe deficiency symptom, that's the case. So I've been working with phosphorus for about um, almost 20 years. And I really like, I like phosphorus because it's one of these elements that's uh, it's kind of quirky in the environment. You'll see why in a few minutes. But my approach in phosphorus and phosphorus in the environment is in moderation. That's what I would suggest to most people. So in soils, you want to apply based on the needs of the crop. Okay, so you can overcome those deficiency symptoms. You don't put too much out where you have excess, where it can move off site or be transported downward. And basically what you don't want to do is oversaturate soils or the mineral phases in soils that can sorb phosphorus. And just like anything, too much, too much phosphorus may not be good, and why? And this may be kind of extreme, but this is what you would get. This is waterway eutrophication at its extreme. And if I were a fish, I sure wouldn't want to live in that environment, okay? Um, is everybody um, familiar with the term eutrophication? Yeah, okay. So, Looking at that last slide, you may ask yourself, well, how the heck did phosphorus end up in that system to begin with? And to understand that, you should really have a relatively strong understanding of the, the phosphorus cycle. And this is how phosphorus cycles in the environment. Um, no pointer, that's okay. So up in the top, <coughs> top here, you have uh, weathering of phosphate rocks, okay? That's natural weathering. Phosphates, it, it's everywhere in the environment. You have weathering of phosphate rocks that is inputting phosphorus into the soil. Uh, the rocks are already present, but they're weathering in place. 
You can have phosphate fertilizer sources, which typically are phosphate rock just ground up and reapplied someplace. You can have residues such as plant residues coming into the soil that all contribute to phosphorus in the soil environment. You can also on this side have decomposition of uh, animal waste that contribute to phosphorus in the environment. In the soil, well, let, me go, let me talk about this upper right hand corner. So when we talk about phosphorus removal, there's really only a couple ways to remove phosphorus from soils. Okay, It's either removed by um, cycling due to harvesting, removing phosphorus to another site, uh, feeding an animal, and then removing that animal off site, or, or leaching. And there's only three really three main ways for phosphorus to move off site. Phosphorus, um, 90, I would say 99.9999% of the time does not become a gas, okay? It's always in some form, not like nitrogen gas in the environment. Um, it's always in some form that's in the soil or in a plant material or in a microorganism, etc. In the soil, this is a really good generalization of what's going on in your soils, okay? Phosphorus enters the soil, it can be, when it enters the soil, there's a number of different phases that the phosphate can end up in. This is phosphate, okay? Phosphate, and really in your instance up here in North Idaho, should be labeled H2PO4. That form is taken up by microorganisms or plants or soared to the soil or leached, okay? So this form is the form that, like I just said, is, um, it's mobile essentially. It can be taken up by plants and removed. It can be um, immobilized, meaning it can be taken up by microorganisms and put into their, their bodies for ATP, ADP, and DNA. Okay, that phase eventually becomes the organic matter that you see in soils, and that phase can be mineralized, but it can be broken down by microorganisms and release phosphate to the environment or it can become insoluble phosphates. This is mineral species, okay? So rocks that contain, or minerals that contain phosphorus. And last but not least, you can have this form leaching. And when we talk about leaching, and I'm, I'm assuming you're pretty concerned about this up here, how do we prevent leaching? Well, one is to remove the plants or, and or animals that are fed those plants. And I can tell you, from my experience that you don't remove a whole lot of phosphorus by harvesting plants compared to how much phosphorus is in the soil. You can add, if you have a phosphorus problem and you have animals on site, you can add that ex, um, excrement to phosphorus, low phosphorus containing areas, or you can keep phosphorus bound in soil mineral phases. Okay, you really have, only have three choices to immobilize phosphorus. Okay, so with that said, that's kind of a, a background. Now I wanna talk about Phosphorus 101. This is what we would teach um, students when I was at the university, teach students in our introductory soil science course and uh, introductory soil chemistry course. And so when we look at phosphorus, if you, if you didn't do anything to a soil, you know, you didn't add any uh, you know, liquid effluent, et cetera, if you just looked at soils in general, Total phosphorus in soils is roughly 200 to 500 parts per million, milligrams per kilogram. And the average across many sites in the US, not the world, is about 600 parts per million. And if you broke that down into organic and inorganic phases, you have about 25 to 50% organic and about 50 to 75% inorganic. Okay, most of, the, most of the phosphorus you find in soils is inorganic, okay, it's not bound in uh, plant tissue, roots, microorganisms, earthworms, etc. Okay, it's in a mineral phase. Most of it is. And I would say that of the total present that you find in a soil, so if you had a total soil test value, I would say about 1% is mobile, give or take. And that's just based on my experience, and that's that's kind of a, a broad brush stroke number, about 1% of the total is available or mobile. Okay, so if you were looking at a soil that hadn't been affected by human uh, activity, if you had 600 parts per million, about 1% or six parts per million is available for uptake or 
bleaching. So this was also biologically available? That would be biologically available. Okay. Yeah. Would that be primarily in a form of orthophosphates? That would be orthophosphate, yeah. That's a generalization, so yeah. <laughs> your soils up here, I'm, I'm not really sure. I would assume that that number may be lower than six part per million, you know, on average. So um, just based on some of the, the information I've seen from NRCS on uh, their soil survey report. The really interesting thing about phosphorus is that when you talk about plants, plants need about one fifth of the amount of phosphorus as they do nitrogen. Nitrogen is king in plant growth, and phosphorus is number two. And so when we apply, what I mean, I see a question back there. there. Confusing, confusing look. What I mean is from an agricultural standpoint, you typically base fertilizer needs based on the crop nitrogen requirement. Not always the case, but more often than not. When you do that and you use something like, say, manure, you typically over apply phosphorus because the plant doesn't need as much, but the manure has quite a bit of phosphorus in it, more than what's necessary for plant growth. So, this is some, you know, it's a conundrum that you have when you deal with um, organic waste materials. Is in terms of plant growth, you typically apply based on the nitrogen needs, but you over apply phosphorus and then you have phosphorus issues in the environment. I've seen it uh, for the last 20 years of my work. It's probably been going on, obviously, been going on a lot longer than that. So, what we're going to do is we're going to let me take a step back here. Okay. So, when we look at, so I told you that the, in the soil, most of the phosphorus is found in the inorganic phase. Okay, that's bound to rocks, minerals, etc. And so. What we're doing is we're splitting the organic and inorganic phases to show you roughly how this works in soils, okay? So the inorganic side of things in soils in terms of mineral phases is dominated by five fractions, okay? You can have the soluble and loosely bound, okay? This is biologically active and that, um, that can obviously be uh, moved or transported or taken up by the organic side of things. On the inorganic side of things, you have aluminum and iron bound phosphorus. I kept these separate from everything else because these are the fractions that really dominate phosphorus chemistry and sorption in soils, even in calcareous systems, at least initially. You can have phosphorus bound to calcium phases, and then you can have something called occluded. And what that means is you have a phosphorus molecule that's covered with something. Okay, it's got a coating of something on it, whatever it is, typically iron coating. You can have calcium coatings as well. This is the form that you're probably most concerned with up here, okay, the biologically active or soluble form. That form over here can be obviously taken up by microorganisms, and then as those microorganisms decompose, you end up with different phases of organic matter that can break down relatively easily, that's this form. Relatively moderately, that's this center form and really, really resistant to degradation. Most of the phosphorus on this side is found in the middle. Okay, You should note that, and I kept this relatively simple, but between all these boxes are lines. There's lines going everywhere. Okay, It's really, really complicated. I'm trying to keep it simple and say that this can go over to here, and this organic pool can degrade and go back over to the inorganic side of things. Okay. But in reality, there's lines going everywhere. So roughly what percentage of the inorganic is soluble and loosely bound? On the inorganic side of things, I would say that um, probably 1% or less is here in this box. In soils, um, in your neck of the woods, I would almost guess that 99%, if it's in an inorganic phase, it's over here. You don't have a whole lot of calcium phosphates up north. I don't think your soils are calcareous. I've never seen any calcareous soils up north. So you can almost disregard this, and they're all scrunched over here. 
And these are relatively resistant to degradation, which is a good thing if you're, if you're worried about phosphorus leaching. So what I want to do, at least for the next few slides, is kind of disregard this, because this is, <laughs> for lack of a better term, this is kind of a black box over here, all right? Um, I've studied this for about 16 years, and every system I study is a little bit different, whereas this one, it's somewhat predictable. So we're gonna focus on this, and in fact, in your situation, and for what we've been doing for um, DEQ, we've been focusing primarily on this side as well. It's easy to model. So this is how phosphorus works in soils. If you have orthophosphate or biologically active phosphorus, how does it become fixed? Well, if you know anything about soils, soils typically, and not always, but are more often than not, are negatively charged okay, for a number of different reasons. But they're negatively charged, so they attract positives. Well, if you remember from that first slide, H2PO4 is negative. So how does that become bound to soil? Huh. It's like I always told the students that I worked with, it's like two magnets, right? You put a negative and negative and they repel one another. So how does it become bound? Well, there's something called loosely bound or loosely held, and that's when you have this H2PO4 molecule, and it's bound or bridged by a cation, like calcium, for instance. Calcium is plus two, or you could put magnesium in here, it has a plus two charge, and the positive is attracted to the negative, and the positive is attracted to the negative. And this is called loosely held, and it's called, it's called loosely held because it's it's easily broken. These bonds are easily broken. So if a plant needs calcium, it can easily take up this calcium if there's not a whole lot of calcium in the soil solution. And then this is free to go. So it's loosely held. Okay, in comparison, the next term is tightly held. And this is what happens along the edges of, uh, say, clay particles or iron oxides or aluminum oxides in soils. You have a soil colloid, and you have, this is a poor representation, but along the edge of that clay particle or aluminum oxide, you have a broken edge, and you have hydroxide sticking out along the edge. You have a negative charge, and this is negative, so you would think they both repel each other. Okay, so interesting, how the heck does this work? And this is how this works. Well, sometimes this phosphate, or H2PO4 molecule, fits perfectly within, you know, this pocket, if you want to call it that. And so it actually becomes part of the colloid structure and it kicks OH out, okay? It kicks the hydroxide out. And so it's actually part of the structure. It's bound to this, this mineral. And when that happens, it's really tightly held. It's hard for H2PO4 to be kicked out of that spot or that, that pocket, okay? And then the third way that Inorganic phosphate can be held in soils is through mineral precipitation. And this is where, you know, it gets a little complicated. I, I don't know why I, when I first saw this back in um, my graduate school days, back in 1989, I just was drawn to this graph. And um, I don't know, it's really strange, but I was drawn to this graph, okay? And um, so this is what it's saying. You've got pH, this is soil pH along the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, you have log phosphorus availability. So the availability of phosphorus, and this is the way it works, as you go up the y-side, phosphorus becomes more available, okay? It becomes more mobile. The, on the graph, the lines that are higher are relatively soluble minerals, and as you come down the graph, the lines are relatively insoluble, okay? If you're, um, from an, if you're a producer in agriculture, from an agricultural standpoint, the reason why people lime their soils back east, do you lime soils up here? No, okay. So back east, like uh, east of the Mississippi, a lot of people lime their soils. In fact, in the southeastern US, they lime their soils quite a bit. And the reason why they lime their soils is to bring the pH up. And they typically shoot for a pH of about six, six and a half. And they do that because, see how these lines come up? right around pH six, six and a half, they, they come up to a point or an intersection. And what that is, is the, the maximum availability of phosphorus in their soils. So they can increase plant growth, productivity, et cetera. That's why they want. In your soils, 
you're typically below seven, probably what, six, two, high fives, something like that. So you're in this range. You're, um, you don't have any calcium phosphates, which are all over here on the right hand side of the screen. So your soils, if you have any um, insoluble precipitates, you're probably dominated by, this is aluminum phosphate, mm -hmm. the mineral is called barosite, and, or iron phosphate, and that's called strengite. If you were to add a phosphorus fertilizer in your system, you probably would add something like this mineral here, it's called monocalcium phosphate. And if you added that to your soils, eventually it would break down because it's relatively soluble. And it would typically form one of these two mineral species. That's how this works. Okay, you have coarse grained non calcareous soils up here. So you're somewhere in between, unfortunately. In fact, you're really coarse up here. So you may be on the low end. When we talk about phosphorus removal, the key is sorption on the mineral phases, okay, strongly fixed, and mineral precipitation. And when you look at the research that's come out over the last 15 years, 10 years, 15 years, the research suggests that aluminum and iron play the major role in almost all soils, at least for initial sorption. So if you're in a calcareous soil, like we have in South Central Colorado, Idaho, sorry, still Colorado in my mind after three years, um, if you're, if you're in a calcareous situation like we have in southern Idaho, the aluminum and iron phosphates still by far dominate initial absorption of phosphorus. So when we talk about absorption of phosphorus in soils, you should know that there's two ways to sorb phosphorus in soils. Well, there's, there's two means of sorption in soils. There's fast sorption and then there's slow sorption. And this is kind of a hypothetical graph. If you took a soil, almost any soil, and you put phosphorus in it, or introduce phosphorus into it, what people typically do is they'll put a soil into a centrifuge tube and shake it for so many minutes or hours or days, okay? And they'll, they'll pull a sample every so often and then measure phosphorus in the solution, how much is left. So you know how much you start with, you shake it for a known period of time, you measure how much is left after a known period of time. And this is typically, I would say almost always, the way phosphorus reacts in soils, at least most, quote, normal soils, okay? You have a fast phase, so phosphorus is sorted really, really fast onto something in the soil. And then you have a really, really slow phase or a lag phase. <coughs> and if you add enough phosphorus, this typically reaches a maximum. Okay, so if you add enough phosphorus, you can see this curve eventually would flatten off. I mean, a soil can only sort so much phosphorus. Right, makes sense. So, with that said, when you look at the mineral phases that initially dominate sorption, they're typically iron or aluminum. And so let's look at two iron species, okay? If in your soil, I would just guess that you would have these in your system. A mineral called ferrohydrite, it's iron hydroxide, or hematite, which is Fe2O3, okay? If you looked at something called the x-ray diffraction um, pattern, you would see that ferrohydrate, it, it's got you know peaks and valleys and whatnot, but it's not as distinct as up here, okay? And what that tells you when you see a graph like this from, um, from a soil chemist standpoint is that this phase is relatively amorphous, meaning it's not very crystalline, and this phase is very crystalline, okay? So ferrohydrate in your systems, if you have a relatively amorphous phase, you have low crystallinity. And if you have this phase, hematite, it's really crystalline. Why is that important? Well, that's important for a number of reasons. First of all, if you look at surface area of these two minerals, the surface area of this is relatively low compared to this. I mean, look, it's about 10, meter, 10 square meters per gram. And this is usually about 300 or more square meters per gram. 300 square meters per gram for one gram of soil. It's huge, right? <laughs> when you think about it, that's a lot. So what that tells you, without going any further, is that this has a lot of sorptive capacity because it has a huge surface area. And this, relatively speaking, has a low sorptive capacity. If you look at the solubility, this is relatively soluble. <laughs> 10 to the, this is 10 to the minus 39 um, 
molar phosphate, which is really, really low to begin with. But it's, in relative terms, this is more, well, slightly more soluble than that. And really, in, um, if you're talking about from a soil chemist standpoint, this is pretty insoluble. So on that previous graph, I showed you slow sorption and fast sorption, right? And so this is typically responsible for the fast sorption phase on that graph, and that's typically responsible for the slow sorption phase. So if you have a combination of both of these, you can have really, really fast sorption if you have a lot of this present in your soil, or if you have a lot of this present in your soil, you can have really, really slow sorption phase. And that might tell you something about how long phosphorus could be stuck in that soil and not leach or not readily leach. <laughs> So, moving on, um, you should know something about iron chemistry because iron and aluminum are really the key players here. But iron, let's just talk about iron chemistry. So, we know from about the last 10 to 15 years of experience in research that iron plays a major role, so does aluminum, but iron plays a major role in the beta zone in the, in the soil. And so, when you talk about iron, you need to know something a little bit more about iron as compared to aluminum, and that's redox or oxidation reduction. And that's because iron can be oxidized, it can be in an oxidized state or the reduced state. What's that mean? Well, that means that you can find iron in a plus three state or a plus two state. Okay, the plus three is oxidized and the plus two is reduced. And if you saw this in your soil, it's pretty obvious. A soil that's aerobic, or in the, the iron is in the plus three state, is either brownish or reddish, or somewhere in between, or yellow. And reduced, it's gray. We call it gray, but it's gray. And that's what happens to iron when it becomes reduced, it becomes gray. And so this is really important, and I'm gonna tell you why on the next slide. I see some people writing some notes down, okay? I'll give you a second to, to absorb that. This is being taped too, right, Alan? So people can look at this again if they need to? Yes, it is. Okay. Go ahead, copies. I always pause when I was teaching. I saw students frantically writing things down, so. <laughs> All right, so why is iron chemistry so important and why is this oxidation reduction so important? Well, iron can get a little funny, for lack of a better term, when it becomes reduced. And you can have this, this is ferrohydrate. This is um, relatively amorphous, if you want to call it that. Okay, FeOH3. And if you have, the IRB stands for iron reducing bacteria. Okay, so if you have bacteria that can use iron uh, ferrohydrate, it can use carbon, if you have carbon present in the system, it can use carbon and change carbon from reduced to oxidized. It basically uses carbon as an energy source. These bacteria use carbon as an energy source and they give up CO2. Okay, so it's taking carbon from a reduced state to an oxidized state. And when they do that, they change iron that iron is in plus three, so it's oxidized. And when they do that, that iron accepts an electron and it changes it to a plus two state, so it becomes reduced. So it goes from a nice brick red, yellow to gray, okay? Now, depending on how fast this occurs, if it even occurs in your system, can mean a few things in terms of iron. If you have relatively low, Fe plus two, you can take that iron and transform it to something called girthite. If you have relatively high Fe plus two concentrations, you can form something called green rust. And that green rust typically converts to something called magnetite, or you can just have a direct conversion to magnetite, okay? This is reduced form, that's a reduced form of iron, so is that. If you're in situations like in South Central um, Idaho, where you have calcareous systems, if you have high iron plus two concentrations and bicarbonate, you can form something called siderite. It's just iron carbonate. It's a reduced form of iron. And last but not least, you can form 
Um, if you have enough phosphate present, you can form the mineral bibionite, which has been shown to be formed under drain fields, directly underneath uh, the, um, the outlets of, of drain fields. I see Larry's head nodding. I'm sure you've heard this before, okay? It's, it's been found in drain fields, but you have to have the right conditions for this. And you typically have the right conditions in drain fields. And bibionite's really, really pretty. It's kind of this blackish, silver, metallic kind of looking uh, mineral. The, what, the reason why I brought this up is because when we talk about iron in the soil, iron undergoes these kind of reactions. On the other hand, aluminum doesn't do that because aluminum is only found in the plus three state. It doesn't have a redox state. So that's just something to be aware of. Okay, A lot of this stuff may seem a little overwhelming. <laughs> and to me, it's always overwhelming every time I look at this. But you should know that when we talk about phosphorus in the environment, you need to have the right conditions to form phosphorus or iron phosphate minerals under reduced conditions. Yes? In uh, an anaerobic condition, do you ever see the formation of struvite? Um, you know what? I I haven't seen it in soils, but I've seen it in dairy effluent. I worked on a project where we tried to form struvite out of dairy effluent, putting in a whole bunch of different things, you know, uh, Pretty common in anaerobic diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. I have so it's, I don't know if it's um, it's not very stable in soils. I was wondering about that. Yeah. So people, if you can recover struvite from say like anaerobic digesters or inside uh, piping from um, whatever processing you're doing, you can actually use that as a phosphorus fertilizer. It's pretty. It's, it's pretty soluble. That's something we're considering. There is, um, I'll put a plug in for the Agricultural Research Service. There's some work that's that's being done in South Carolina where they're actually forming something like struvite or struvite like struvite like substance from, I think it's hog effluent. <laughs> and they're having great success. They're pulling out like 95% of the phosphate <clears throat> in the stream. It's pretty impressive. They've come up with this whole system. I don't know that, that much detail, but if you're really interested, I can get you in contact with somebody who knows. That's okay. Okay. Got some national people working on it. There you go. All right. So let's, I have one slide on aluminum chemistry, and this is a really, really interesting project that I worked on uh, right before I came here to Idaho. And to give you some background on this project, this was a site that I worked on for about uh, 15 years where we applied biosol sewage sludge surface applied to a soil, a rangeland soil. And we wondered what would happen, actually, let me take a step back further. So we applied biosolids to a soil in Colorado. And then we also applied biosolids plus this aluminum-based drinking water treatment sludge to the soil. And we wondered, well, if we had a huge rain event that saturated the soil for a number of days and the system went anaerobic, what would happen to the phosphate? Would it be released? or not. And so what we did was we took a control soil which had nothing added, soil which had biosolids added, and a soil that had biosolids plus this aluminum water treatment residual or drinking water treatment plant and sludge. And we, had, we took all those soils, this was replicated four times, we took those soils and we put them in an anaerobic condition. It's called an anaerobic glove bag. So we, we could drop the redox way down. And over time, we measured the amount of phosphate in solution. Okay, so we had these soils in a liquid, and we put this whole thing in the glove box, dropped the redox, and measured phosphate over time. And this is really interesting. So if you look at the control soil, really nothing's happening. We get a little bit of phosphate coming off. The soil plus the biosolids, I should mention, this is kind of important, but the biosolids, when you have uh, at least some of these digesters, they're uh, in Colorado, they use anaerobic digestion. I don't know what you use up here. But they use anaerobic digestion, and to offset H2S uh, emissions in their digester, they add iron. So this thing's loaded with iron, and it's got iron phosphate in it. And so you have a redox condition, and boom, the phosphate goes way up. Okay? So this is a good example of what could happen in situations where you don't have vibionite being produced, uh, iron phosphate in the reduced form. Okay? We added water treat residuals that had a lot of aluminum in, uh, in that material. And lo and behold, you didn't see a whole lot of phosphorus coming off. So 
the point I'm trying to drive home here is that iron chemistry can really affect your system. And if you have some aluminum, aluminum's kind of a even keel in your system. It's kind of interesting. Okay, I have a few more slides. And I just want to briefly talk about some of the information that you could find out there in terms of soils, if you're not familiar with this. And one of the classics is the NRCS, it used to be called the Soil Conservation Service, but they're soil surveys. And it, have you ever seen these? Have you ever seen them in color? Yeah, the, the colored ones are fantastic. They're from the early 1900s and, and they're really, really neat to look at. But you can find these um, occasionally in libraries if you're lucky. Um, they're really, really hard to find. This is the classic example of trying to figure out you know, what kind of soil you're working with and what kind of conditions are in, within that soil. This is a more modern approach. This is the web soil survey. It's basically the soil survey that you saw on the last slide, but digitized. And it's upgraded to contain a heck of a lot more information than you typically would find in the, the hard copy. It's, has anybody ever used this? You've used it, yeah. What do you think? It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. It, the difficulty is it's, it's normally only about five feet of depth. So for subsurface sewage disposal, it has some limitations because you're looking at the receiving soil that may be deeper than what is normally categorized. Yeah, that's the unfortunate part about pulling data from NRCS is that they typically only go to five feet. So if you want to try to find more information with depth, you'll have to go someplace else, like uh, you know maybe the University of Idaho. They might have some information. Or I don't know if DQ has information with depth or somebody, but typically not. It's hard to find. The one thing that I don't like about this is that you have to zoom in, you have to really know where you're going. You have to zoom in relatively close, I think it's 10,000 acres, and then to, to go around with the little tabs and find the information you're really looking for, it can be somewhat cumbersome. So there's a really, really cool app for Google Earth. And I just found out about this within the last two months. Has anybody seen this? Now, this, this is really cool. So somebody at, uh, I think it's UC Davis, must have had a grant to do this. And they, they, made up, they made this application for Google Earth that has all that soil information in it. So if you have Google Earth, like everybody has Google Earth, right? You can have it on your mobile phone, you can have it on your computer, you can have it anywhere, and you can get soils information instantaneously. It's really, really cool. I'm a soils person, so this is really cool. <laughs> and so when I loaded this, you know, when you zoom in, you get all these dots all over the place, and the dots represent different soil types. They're called soil series. And you can click on one, so this is Post Falls, and I clicked on one that's really dominant for this area. It's called the Garrison Gravelly Silk Loam, and it's got zero to seven percent slopes, and this is what the profile looks down to 150 centimeters. And if, and I, for some reason, I couldn't get screen capture, because I have two monitors at my desk, and so it captures both monitors, which is beyond me, but does that so I couldn't show you more but if you pull this up if you pull this up you can click on the name and it'll pull up all this information that you typically find in the web soil survey and it's it's literally at your fingertips and it's relatively quick so you don't have to um, you still have to do a little bit of searching but it's not as uh, painful as the NRCS web soil survey so if you if you want to get this information you need to go to that website and then on the Somewhere on the bottom left, you'll select Google Earth Interface, and it's, it loads almost instantaneously. It's amazing that you, know, you can load all that information almost instantaneously to your computer. It's really fun to work with, too. It's, it's incredible. OK, so before we take any questions, if you haven't seen this document, it's called Phosphorus Geochemistry and Septic Tank Soil Absorption Systems and Groundwater. Is everybody, anybody not familiar with that document? This is a this is a really really good document. I can't remember how many pages it is. It's but it's a pretty big document. It's like three megs. It's free, but what Lombardo Associates has put together is kind of what I just described. And then they also have case write-ups for different locations within the U.S. and Canada, I believe. And it's a really really great website or great information to. Um, to download and take a look, especially for the kind of the issues um, you're dealing with up here in the north. 
And with that, I don't know if we have time for any more questions or you want to just want to keep this informal or it's up to you. But I appreciate your attention. So that uh, you mentioned the Colorado study you did, was that was that through Colorado State or was that through like Parker Ag and the guys that you all the uh, land application? That was uh, just through Colorado State. Actually, it was with the city of Fort Collins, okay. in Colorado State. And I've, I've worked with Parker Ag before. Mike Sharp, and do you know those guys? Yeah. They, I was talking to um, Alan before, and I, I worked on a project down in uh, Lamar, Colorado, south, sure. southeastern Colorado, yeah. and they applied uh, sewage sludge from New York City to how many hundreds of thousands? Yeah. yeah. Tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of acres. They a lot. Yeah, they've got a lot. I may interject real quickly here. Uh, let's just keep going. But uh, I think that well, the reason that Dr. Ippolito is here is in our meeting of two months ago, approximately two months ago, we all agreed that phosphorus is, is the primary area of concern. And so uh, I want to keep Dr. Ippolito's presentation in context in that in a much bigger picture, what we're trying to do once again is understand whether this is a viable, viable opportunity. And as our discussion progresses and continues, we'll, we'll just grow with it by sharing. But uh, once again, Q&A, continue. I'm getting lunch ready. So if you have any more questions, uh, uh, just uh, let them fly. So how do we use, I mean, I've read through in, in some of the materials that uh, Larry and uh, Alan provided, uh, some scenarios that you gave um, breakout duration on. But the primary component that seemed to be the variable was the, the soil chemistry, which was primarily what iron and aluminum were available. How would we go about testing to be able to determine the soils here and the receiving as to where, where it fits in that range? Because it looks like it's a substantial difference based on that chemistry. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I don't know of any testing labs in Idaho that would do that test. It's not. The test is called ammonium oxalate extraction, and it's uh, not a typical test. But the testing, I know the testing lab at the soil, uh, the soil plant and water testing lab at Colorado State University will do that test, and it's about $20. I'm not promoting them, but uh, there's just to kind of give you a ballpark if you can find another testing lab that would do that extraction and, and uh, analysis. So we look, here, we, we look locally and the, the local labs don't test, they'll test for total iron and, and aluminum, but it, that's not what, it has to be the amorphous to, to fit into this bond. Yeah, I would suggest doing the amorphous extraction, yeah. Is there, and there isn't a direct relationship between the two? It's not a good cap, good gauge between total and, because that seems to be a fairly easy test we can run here locally with the, the, the oxalate extraction test is really, really easy. It's just people just don't typically do it. it you know, it's run in the dark. It's a two hour extraction in the dark. It, it's really simple. I don't know why people don't do it more often. I don't know if there's a relationship. I've never seen a, a true relationship between amorphous and total. It seems like it's all over the board. That's what, right. that's what the lab said here, that there wasn't a good, wasn't a good. People have tried to correlate total to phosphorus, um, to phosphorus sorption, and doesn't seem like it fits very well. Or um, what fits really well is amorphous space or some kind of uh, soil extraction. Like up here, you probably do what, a grade one or a melic three extraction. I don't know if you ever looked at phosphorus um, chemistry in terms of an agricultural standpoint, but you would probably do one of those two extractions. We can talk about that later if you want. I can give you some more information. Bottom line is I would suggest some more of aluminum and iron. So to prevent phosphorus moving through the environment and getting into groundwater or surface water, what would be the ideal soil characterization that would help by finding that phosphorus? I, I would look, if it were me, and based on the information that I've seen out there, I would look at amorphous aluminum and iron concentration in the soil, so anything less than two millimeters in diameter. So up here, you would need to take soil core, figure out the, you know, the um, volume of uh, coarse material, if anything greater than two millimeters in diameter, and then separate that from the quote soil, anything less than two millimeters in diameter, and have that that uh, subset sample and analyzed for amorphous aluminum and iron. 
then you'd, you have to back, this is what I would do, I would back calculate to figure out really how much amorphous aluminum and iron I have with depth. And then you could do some relatively simple modeling to figure out how much sorption and, and life you would have in that system. But in general, you won't, you'd want those higher concentrations of the aluminum and, and certain iron in either the oxidized or reduced state to, to, to meet those processes that you kind of described the same as what would grab and hold phosphorus. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if you, if you had seen the information that we put together for DQ. No, there, were, there were six tables, so this is what we did for DQ. We, we tracked down soils information in the state of Idaho that had information regarding amorphous aluminum and iron concentrations. Really hard to find, but I found six soils initially. This is about a year ago. Took those concentrations and then plugged those concentrations into a model called Visual Mintech. It's just a chemical speciation model and then looked at how long it took for a certain amount of phosphorus to come out of the system based on the, the amount of aluminum and iron in, in the system. And the, obviously the more aluminum, amorphous aluminum and iron you have in a soil, the better off you are. It's just the bottom line. There's a soil up north here, it's called the Three Bear Soil Series. And I think it's actually further north than here, but that soil based on modeling can probably last what do we figure, like 130 years before we saw phosphorus coming out at the one foot depth? It had a tremendous amount of uh, amorphous aluminum and iron present in it. It looks like you have the table here. Does this, does this address fate transport of phosphorus in uh, drain field systems that have been inundated or definitely anaerobic? That's a good question. It's a huge document. I don't remember. I don't remember if they, they discuss anaerobic conditions, but they do talk about some case studies where they've seen phosphate plumes moving through the system, and uh, they they give you the scenario, the background information, and they also talk about the phosphorus chemistry um, in regards to transport. So it's it's a really really good document. It's probably the best document I've seen in terms of phosphorus being transported drain fields. And I, I forget who suggested this to us, Alan, but it was early on that we take a look at it. And all of the information I've looked at to date, this summarizes almost everything. It's just a really great document. There are there are obviously locales within the county, some on the aquifer, some not, where you'll see rain on snow events. So I mean you're definitely going to be inundating rain fields where you have the potential. <clears throat> Some drain fields on the south side of the river are going to be very close to bedrock. So I think you can draw some conclusions, but I don't have any hard data. Good point. Were you, uh, is there a, is the idea that you could potentially line your drain field trenches with a assorptive material uh, that you could use to? to uh, have a certain amount of useful life that would be, you could utilize it to prevent the uh, phosphorus from, from over, uh, overloading the drinking water system or the surface water system? Yeah, that's, that's a good concept. So, did everybody hear that question? Is there a material we can line drain field uh, trenches with to sort of phosphorus? And I would say yes, if you can get a hold, hold of something like these water treat residuals or, you know, some kind of amorphous aluminum or iron phase or there's some other materials out there, I'm not going to promote anything, but you know, what do we look at in terms of our, our DQ setback subcommittee, uh, phosphosorb or, or phosphex and phosphex. And I think Lombardo Associates has their own phosphorus removal mechanism system. It's a essentially kind of a sand filter, pre-drain filter kind of device that they're using. So there's a few out there commercially available. You know, the only thing, the only thing that you have to be cautious about when you do that is you need to make sure you have more than not enough because you don't want to dig up your drain field to replace all that material. So, um, from a practical standpoint. But that, that concept is actually being used, working on a project with the city of Boise to put that kind of material, phosphorus or materials into um, um, uh, surface runoff uh, drain field systems and looking at life, life expectancy. And a lot of that work is actually being done in agricultural systems as well 
in southeastern U.S., like in Florida, for example, they've done quite a bit of work with this, and they show if a material like that buried down three, four feet, their soils are very sandy, not coarse, uh, not as coarse as up here, but they're very sandy soils. And they're, they're beach sand, essentially. Uh, you can sort almost all of the phosphorus that's moving through the system. The question I would have with that approach, though, would be for how long? Because once, once you've bound the uh, phosphorus to that material, it's no longer available for sorption, correct? And, and so, so the question is, how do you design it so that you can, what you're creating is a filter that has a, a specified light. How, how do you build in the ability to maintain that filter? Yeah, I think that's the bottom line is how long do you expect your drain field to last? So there's gotta be a certain expectation. And then there's some equations you actually can use to you know, calculate roughly calculate how much material you need to put in to drain or to absorb so much phosphorus. And it's based on surface area, it's based on um, total material that you have present, and obviously sorption capacity. And there's probably a couple other factors I'm, I'm forgetting here. One of my colleagues that works at the University of Florida has done some calculations like that. You can, you can actually do that. Uh, if you're interested, I can send you the paper with a few papers that kind of go through the description of how you do that. It's not for a drain field, but it's the concept is really similar. Are you familiar with the work that Spokane County is doing on this? I mean, this this is their their study, really looking at the same issue of how long, what what breaks out as uh, on, on site systems, and theirs is in regards to the uh, the, the discharge limits to the their, their trading pollution trading to try to say what's the equivalent of taking one drain field off and putting them on to uh, connecting to the sewer. You know, I'm, a, I'm somewhat familiar. I, I've glanced through that document. Uh, the last few weeks have been really busy for me, but I've glanced through it and I understand the trading issue. There are, uh, we're dealing with some similar issues down near Boise with trading. And, you know, maybe it's not exactly the same, but the issue is the wastewater treatment facility has really no means of pulling out any more phosphorus economically. So what they're doing is trading as well. And they bought some land and they're pulling, they're, this is the, the scenario, they want to pull out phosphorus from agricultural runoff. So they're trading phosphorus for phosphorus. So they can keep their phosphorus loads from the wastewater treatment facility at current or maybe at slightly less levels. And they're removing phosphorus from some other source over here that eventually dumps into the, the Boise River and into the snake. So the concept is the same, um, I'm assuming. It's trading. I, I don't know if it's a good or bad idea. You know, some of the, the issues and ideas that Boise has, I, I kind of like what they're doing in terms of trying to, uh, you know, remediate some of these issues, but I'm not going to say it's good or bad. Well, at the front part of your slide, you were talking about you know, the different states that phosphorus can exist in, organic, inorganic. And then you talked about the soils and how the soils interact. Is there, is there a benefit to know more detail about the nature of the phosphorus and, and how it, its state is? And then in addition to, you know, the, the soil side of it? That's a good question. Um, you know, from a, from a basic standpoint, it's interesting. I think from a practical standpoint, you probably don't need to go that far. You know, as long as you have a good handle on how much amorphous spaces you have present, that's really the, the bottom line. And all the, not all, but a lot of the papers that have come out in research over the last 10 years or so have really focused on amorphous spaces. I mean, they tried to do all sorts of things like total iron and aluminum content, um, not so much on the organic side of things, but then uh, availability indices, you know, like soil extraction um, tests that you typically would do if you were a producer, you know, crop producer. And they, they seem to work, but amorphous aluminum and iron is really the key. That's the key. It's kind of fun to look at the cycling. You know, I've had, I had a grad student look at that, that one graph that had the inorganic and the organic. That was based on two years of work from one of my graduate students a while back. She, there were lines going all over the place, correlation analysis and numbers. And it was really confusing. So I, I didn't want to you know, hit you over the head with all this stuff that maybe would blind you. 
Right. Well, I think when we were talking about the bigger picture of the, the fate of phosphorus through the Spokane River and the Marathon Prairie Aquifer, if you talk to ethnologists, they don't care whether phosphorus is inorganic or organic, at some point that's going to be available for biologic uptake. At some point in its life span, whether you're talking, you know, in terms of days or minutes versus months or years. And so, you know, there's the perspective of what time frame you're looking at in that in that fate of the phosphorus as it moves to the environment. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, I'll just say that based on stuff, some of my experience and some of my colleagues' experience, if you look at phosphate bound to amorphous, uh, at least aluminum phases and iron phases, there's other phases out there, but if you look at those two phases, they're really, really recalcitrant. Meaning that, you know, in one, su in one study we looked at, uh, that study that I showed you, the, the graph with the biosolids and the larger residuals, that study, you, if you put phosphorus on that system in the form of biosolids, that phosphorus is bound to the aluminum phase very strongly even after 13 years of just sitting there. It's, it hasn't gone anywhere. In fact, sor sorption has increased onto that aluminum, that amorphous aluminum phase. And I have some other colleagues that work, work out of Florida and they've shown the same thing with iron, uh, amorphous iron phases. Um, they did a seven and a half year study and they put this amorphous iron phase in the soil. They bound a heck of a lot of phosphorus and it didn't come off that, that substance. So that, that's why I keep, you know, driving the point home that the amorphous aluminum and iron phases are really, really key to sorbian phosphorus. And, you know, if you want to call it short term, you know, 13 years is, I think, a long term study for research, but that's still short term. Really, if you're talking about phosphorus movement into the Spokane River, I, mean, I don't know what's going to happen in 20 years. I would assume it's uh, still be bound to that phase, but I can't tell you that with any certainty. 